you do not understand white supremacy, what it is, and how it works, everything else that you do understand will confuse you. In all of these nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, anywhere on the planet, minute by minute, day by day, all of the time, all of the time. Okay, am I on? Here. Alrighty. Welcome to uh, Blog <laughs> Blog Talk. Welcome to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. I am your co host, Mr. Bobby. Uh, the technical difficulty that you experienced was on my end, but I think I got it together, so we will proceed with the show. If you would like to call in, you can do so by calling 516 453 9921. When you do that, make sure you press the number one button and you will go to the top of the line. You can also gmail me at the numeral 7, Mr. Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y, at gmail.com. And if the show <clears throat> permits it, depending upon, excuse me, depending upon the questions that are coming in, and if they forward it to me, I will read it that day. However, if it uh, doesn't happen that way, your Gmail will be read at some point in time, and when it does, I will give you the date and the time that you can hear your your question as if it's not automatically erased by the system. So we'll go from there. Okay. Hmm. On the line from Washington, D.C., we have Mr. Neely Fuller. And, Mr. Fuller, good morning, and how are you? Good morning. I'm still learning. Okay, let's go. Let's start off. I told this brother last week that I would um, get him. By the way, thank you for uh, the people who are in the chat room. Uh, Navarro, let's see, Navarro Laurie is in. Good, okay. Chat room is open also. I told this brother from South Africa that I would uh, give him first dip since he had patiently waited. So I'll read his questions to you, Mr. Fuller. It's like this. It says, Mr. Fuller, I live in South Africa, and I've seen an increase in the LGBTQ group. I have also witnessed a white man grabbing a black male's anus. So when you say that the black female's vaginal 
will be replaced by the white man's anus. To me, it made sense because it's something we're increasingly seeing as well as the black female being conditioned to be aggressive toward the black male, which leaves me, which leaves a black male seeking the white woman's vagina. My question for you, Mr. Fuller, is this. What does the word entangled mean to you? Well, entangled means just that. Uh, confusion, it can mean that if you choose for that word to mean that. Uh, entanglement, uh, if you're talking about a philosophy, of, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about wires, if you're talking about something in the physical world, you could have entangled wires, you can have entangled nerves, you can have uh, uh, many things are entangled. Uh, the word entangled just means something that's entangled, uh, something that's connected with something else, but it's not done so in a way that makes sense. Uh, is functional, that accomplishes something of constructive value. Uh, that's that's the word, that's what I think of when I think of that word. Okay. All righty. Well, being that he made this particular observation down in South Africa, where apparently. Um, uh, there's been a lot of stuff going on concerning the the anus, in particular the white male's anus, being the uh, 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 the new uh, vagina. Why are they making or trying to portray the black female's vagina as obsolete? Because they're saying black people basically uh, should not proliferate they, 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 it's aimed at cutting down the population and also causing more than that causing maximum confusion in the area of sexuality any way that they can see the, the uh, according to the compensatory counter racist logic can confuse people sexually you can very easily confuse them in just about everything else because sex is extremely powerful. People are motivated sexually. Uh, as, a, as young people, they begin to feel something happening to their bodies that they don't seem to understand or have control of. And uh, that's why a lot of pedophiles like to prey on, you might say, young people, very young, uh, in religious groups, for example. Uh, a lot of people have been reported to have figured out a way to very easily prey on young people before they begin to understand their bodies and which way their bodies are going to handle this thing called sexuality. So pedophiles find a excellent venue for doing that. Uh, so people have to kind of watch anyone who's suspected of being a pedophile uh, coming around, people who are always wanting to volunteer to do babysitting work, particularly males around other young males and be their babysitter, or they want to adopt uh, some people. Now, this is not to say that all people do this, or even a majority. I don't know what the numbers are. But the whole idea is to catch people when they can be most vulnerable to be confused in anything dealing with sex. And if you want to dominate their minds in all other areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, and war, if you can steer a person the way that you want that person to go sexually, 
in the area of activity called sex. It'll be very easy to steer them in the way you want them to go in religion or in economics or anything else because sex is a very, very powerful motivation. Get control of a person's sexuality. You have them just about under your control in everything else, in handling money, you name it. It all falls right in line. Hmm. Okay. The number you can call to get in contact with the show, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> is 516-453-9921. Make sure you press the number one button. You'll go right to the top of the show, right to the top. Um, another question comes from Manifesting. It says this, Mr. Fuller. With the Karen K R K A R R E N movement on the rise, are victims of white supremacy getting justice when they record the incident? I have seen these Caucasian women call the police on African American men hoping something happens to him, but every time it's recorded, these women seem to lose it all, like jobs and more. Thank you for answering my question. Uh, they call the law enforcement when they see a black male involved in something? Yeah, even if the man is standing in his own yard cutting his grass. Uh, sometimes the, uh, uh, the, the authorities have been called on a black male. Sure. That goes with racism. This is plain old racism. That's That's been like forever. That's Racism is what dominates the entire world. That's why we have this program. That's why racism is right at the forefront of everything. It says on the back of the textbook, the victims of uh, textbook for victims of white supremacy that people can go to by going to ProduceJustice.com. The second point, no major problem that exists between the people of the known universe can be eliminated until racism is eliminated. Now, that's when you say major problem, we're talking about no major problem between people. That's the premise. Now, that statement is either true or false. You're not going to iron out anything in any area of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war on this planet called the planet Earth until the system of white supremacy is it as a first step toward universal man and universal woman, you eliminate the system of racism. White supremacy is racism. Racism is white supremacy. It's the most powerful government that has ever been experienced by the people of planet Earth in recorded history. And it is a government designed to do harm to people who are classified as non-white. That's what the government is designed to do. And as long as you have it, you're going to have all of these conflicts. Uh, shouldn't be a question mark by now. Uh, you're going to have it. and you, There's no way, no way to end it. No way to straighten out anything. In any relationship, nothing is going to work the way that it should mm -hmm. between people. Now, between people and things, the white supremacists are experts at that. The white supremacists are the most advanced people on the planet Earth when it comes to motivating things, it comes to making discoveries, scientific breakthroughs, etc. When it comes to people, on account, of the, on account of the factor of racism, everything is going to continue to be a shambles. There's no way to straighten out relationships. I don't care what type of institutions they set up. I mean, uh, to, to be cordial between people or harmony between people or this word that many people love to use, and that's love. None of that's going to happen. 
mm-hmm. as long as you have the system of white supremacy in place. Now, these statements are either true or false. Okay. So so all of these events that people are talking about, that's going to be ad infinitum. It's not going to stop. It's going to keep going on forever, 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 and forever until you replace the system of white supremacy with the system of justice. That's number one. Then you can move on to other things. No way to do it. It's impossible. Can't be done. Well, if it's so good, why 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 would they want to give it up if if it's so profitable? All the more reason why it's been around so long. Because we have never experienced what justice is like. Justice okay. meaning guaranteeing that no person is mistreated, and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. But on account of the productivity of things and the convenience for the people who are classified as white on what we call the planet Earth, it's hard to uproot. To go to a white person and say, give up the system of white supremacy and replace it with what? And you say justice. And they say, well, what is justice? You say, well, guaranteeing that nobody's mistreated. Nobody. Not for five minutes. Nowhere on the planet. And guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help, always, without fail. And they say, well, that's a big job to do. I mean, to guarantee that nobody's mistreated and guarantee that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help, Mm -hmm. that's the definition of justice. That's the logical and only definition for justice. You either have it or you don't. No yes, such sir. thing as a little bit of justice. So the white supremacist said, yeah, but nobody has ever achieved that. And uh, since we got a system that does produce things called the system of white supremacy, more productivity when it comes to material things than any system ever thought up by people and the motivation to keep that system going that people benefit from all over the world, material-wise, better than anything else that's ever been invented. The system of white supremacy, why give it up for something that's abstract, like justice? And they have a point there. But it should be tried. Okay. Because it has been conceived. The conception of justice has is there. We have a conception of it. It's never existed in recorded history, but we do have a concept of it. And the theory is, if you have a concept of something, if the mind is able to conceive of it, to perceive of it, maybe it can be produced. That's been proven down through history. If the mind can think of it, it might be able to be done. Mm -hmm. But it'll take some effort. Okay, let's do this. So let's go to the phone lines and chat. Sahid, excuse me, I'm, I butchered your name as usual. Again, from Dallas. If I can get you up in here, wait a minute. Uh, whoa, hmm, he went off the screen here. Well, I need him back here. We are efforting. Trust me, brother. From my brother, there you go. From Dallas, it's not your fault. I think I got you on. Good morning, and you are on, Mr. Fuller. Go ahead with your question, please. Uh, morning, Mr. Fuller, and morning, Mr. Bobby. Good morning, sir. I have a question about uh, one of the movies on Mr. Fuller's uh, movie list. And okay. The movie is called "The um, Man in the Gray Flannel Suit." And my question is, there's a scene in the movie where they're on the battlefield, and uh, Tommy, the Gregory Peck, Peck carrier, I mean, a uh, character that is a captain, he's throwing hand grenades, and uh, after he throws about the third hand grenade, he kills his uh, best friend, and uh, he tried to tell him to, to uh, get out the way after he threw it, he threw it but it was too late. And uh, he goes up there and picks the body up, and uh, he started hollering for a medic. So he goes down 
and finds a medic, and the medic tells him that the man is dead. So he said, well, no, no, look at him again because the man is not dead. And then he said he want to find, he's going to go find a, a real doctor. So the medic calls three other uh, soldiers over there and say, hey, come, come over here. So when they come up, he pulls a, uh, Gregory Peck pulls out a knife and, and um, like he want to attack the guys. And so um, one of the soldiers told the medic, well, you better let him go because somebody can get hurt, hurt here. So he picks the body up and then he walks off with the body again and he comes across this a black soldier and then the black soldier try to help him with the body and then he, he tells the black soldier he needs a medic and so he tells him, well, some, some medics are coming in now on the boat and then he, then he helps him with the body and so the uh, brother tells him that this man is dead. So he yells at that guy and says, the man is not dead. So my question is, and that scene is the lesson is that we shouldn't let our emotions come into place when we're as um, uh, victims of racism and white supremacy while we're out on the battlefield because we are at war. Oh, so your question is, do you let your emotions take over or whatever the situation is? We should not let our emotions take over yes, because it I mean. seems like his emotions took over while he's out on the battlefield and we could end up in greater confinement or even dead. Yes, yes. Uh, well, what we're talking about here is a thing called emotions. Emotions serve a purpose, but emotions have to be attached to logic in order to do what? in order to produce the most constructive effect. See, every move that you make is going to have a constructive effect or a non-constructive effect. So a person can have a lot of emotions running down a football field, and the ball is in the air coming toward the person. So your emotions are at a fever pitch, and you're heading right toward the end zone. But you're not too sure because the wind maybe is blowing, that you can catch that ball. So your emotions kick in and say, I got to catch the ball. I got to catch the ball. And if you catch the ball, well, your emotions work the way that you intended for them to work because it, you were able to concentrate. But if you lose your concentration because you let your emotions get too way out of hand, you might say. Yes, You've sir. got this adrenaline flowing, as they say and the ball is wobbling in the air, and you start thinking, your emotions tell you, I can't catch this ball. I can't catch mm -hmm. it to win. You know, I can't run this fast, and, and the ball seems like it's going the other way. Well, if you start thinking that way, that's most likely what's going to happen. You're going to miss catching the ball. So I just gave that illustration, I mean, to correlate with what you're talking about. Uh, your emotions... You're always supposed to, to as best as you possibly can. Emotions will take over a situation if you mm -hmm. don't attach it to logic. All right? And logic means you're able to think clearly. Like when I'm on this program, I judge myself by how, not so much by whether what I'm saying will be believed or taken seriously, et cetera, et cetera. But I concentrate on making myself clear, like even trying to illustrate this illustration I'm just giving right now. Do mm -hmm. I have focus and do I have clarity? And I might say this to the audience right now. Out of four stars, because I rate myself by stars, uh, four being the highest number, I've never given myself over two and a half stars on any program. Just a little bit of edge on some. But as far as reaching four, for focus and for clarity, uh, I, I have to be, you know, I, I'm, I'm in training. And I don't know if I'm making myself clear to everybody who's listening. Because if 
there are a thousand people listening, it's not supposed to be one person who is confused about my answer to a question. Not one. I mean, that, that falls off that four chart uh, thing. If, if it's a thousand people listening, everybody understands what's being said except one. That knocks out the four stars right there. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be 100% clear and 100% clear. Uh, okay. Uh, focused. Okay. Jadid from Dallas, thank you so much, brother, for calling. Sorry I butchered your name, but don't be a stranger. All right? That's all right. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's do this. Um, I want to say especially to, and I can use his name, George Thompson, a question came up last week from a caller about, um, I guess it was the Cardi B video, which I had not seen then, but subsequently I have uh, viewed it, seen it, and as a, as a matter of fact, excuse me again, I spoke with uh, a few people, including my daughter, about it to get their impressions of it. Um, uh, it um, I will say this, Mr. Fuller, or I will ask this, Mr. Fuller, do you know of Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion, and have you seen the video uh, WAP? And that's all I'm going to say concerning that moniker, because it's, um, I guess it could be con construed as a derogatory situation. But anyway, Mr. Fuller, have you seen that yet? No, I have not. Okay. And I don't know what it's about. Yeah, okay. Well, if you get a chance, maybe you can have somebody... Um, Look at the or put that up for you so you can see that. I think it's only about four minutes, but uh, you might want to look at that. And I'm quite sure that everybody who is listening would be interested in your thoughts concerning that. But anyway, I just want to thank um, George Thompson. And there have been a few others who also contacted me and, and put it up so that I could view it because I would have never viewed it. On on my um, on my own, but but thank you. Fact, matter of fact, thank all the listeners who communicate with me and have me look at stuff or read stuff or research stuff. And I would just want to thank you. Since we are at this particular point, go ahead and cue that music up before I go to the seven one six area. Thank you very much. You're listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. I am your co-host, uh, Mr. Bobby. And uh, if you'd like to get in contact with the show, call this number, and that number is 516-453-9921. Uh, Let me do that again. 516-453-9921. Be sure to press the number one button, and you will go to the head of the line. And your question will be next um, in in that particular order. It might be a long, it might be a while before we get to it, but you will move right up there. If you elect not to do that, of course you can Gmail me at the numero seven, Mr. Bobby B O B B Y, at gmail dot com, and I will read that. Um, provided that we have time this day, or it comes up in rotation, it will be read. And you will be informed about that date and time. Okay, in about, uh, let's see here. Thank you. In about 17 minutes, we'll have Mr. Fuller speak on his uh, uh, book. And I understand uh, we got an update again this morning that everything is in. All three books are in. That's good. And uh, anything you want to know is up on the website. Mr. Fuller will also mention that at Produce Justice. Dot com. Okay, let's go to the 716. That is in the Buffalo area. We got Anthony. Anthony, you are on with Mr. Fuller, and how are you? I'm still learning. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just like you guys. Yes, sir. Um, A quick note, produce just justice.com it will not load for me now i've tried to uh, lo load other sites those sites are loading up fine but producejustice.com is not loading for me and i've tried it several times now okay uh it is noted and we have other people uh, technicians who are uh on with mr fuller and myself they are listening and uh if there is a problem like that, they will inform me 
and then whatever information that they give me, I will relay uh, that information uh, on to uh, you and others who may be having that uh, problem. Thank you for uh, that inquiry. Go ahead, please, sir, with your question. All right, I have two 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 quick questions, please. The first if one is quick, uh, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll be quick. The first one, uh, Ms. Fuller is. Uh, Dr. Point, Dr. King has a famous quote. He said that, that violence is the voice of the unheard. Uh, in in 2020, um, we're seeing a lot of rioting, looting, burnings, uh, you know, just all types of uh, destructive things. And it seems that when the people are are are, are destructive that they get a response ver- versus when they're uh, more silent. It's like white, the white supremacist, they don't address them at all. So the question well, is, is, is there is there any constructive outcome of writing? It's the first question. Well, if you're talking about people rioting uh, in the code book, I put in years ago that black people should not participate in riots because the logical reason, everything in a code is supposed to be logical, is that a lot of people who should not be harmed get harmed. That shouldn't happen. That's not in line with the concept of justice. People are harmed who should not be harmed. A lot of black people who have gone, you know, worked all their days to go into business. Uh, and, you know, they very, very little support. And during a riot, you have people just running around doing all kinds of things. They don't care who they hurt as long as it's not them as an individual for the moment. And everybody gets caught up in a frenzy because that's what a riot is. So if you're talking about rioting and burning things and and, uh, tearing up things, uh, buildings, turning over cars and all that type of thing, the code does not advocate that at all. The place that you burn down may be the place where your cousin has to be employed. And you say, well, that's a part of the sacrifice. Well, if you want to sacrifice... uh, your cousin having a job that next week or you want to sacrifice your grandmother because now she can't get her medicine anymore because uh, the drug stores have all been burned out and she's trying like everything to get her prescription filled and there's no place to go to get it and nobody's going into the area you've got soldiers probably there now by now in many instances, with bayonets fixed and a lot of tape up saying nobody's allowed into this area. This is a crime scene. We had some people who were burned up in the buildings that were burned, uh, people in wheelchairs who couldn't get out of a certain building at a certain time when the rioting was going on. This, these things have happened, okay? People get harmed who should not get harmed. And uh, a lot of people call that collateral damage. But in the concept of justice, there's no such thing as that. I mean, you're either helping people or you're not. Mm -hmm. And this battlefield sacrifice, a lot of people call it by different names, it should not happen. You should be very precision if you're going to be counter-violent. That's what the code calls it. You have violence, you have non-violence, and you have counter-violence. Well, counter-violence is violence against the people who are causing the violence, okay? But you have to be very specific. It's precision work. Like, say, in World War II, for example, uh, out of frustration, which is what happens, that's a, frustration is an emotion, and you don't have a scientific way of doing uh, what you're trying to do, bummer crews, after missing the target, with the targets being factories that were producing munitions and armed material and things happened 
the opposition military, so they started doing a thing called carpet bombing, meaning they'd just bomb everything and hope that they'd be able to hit what they were trying to hit in the process. Well, in some circumstances, in what you call traditional warfare, mm-hmm. that 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 has worked to a degree. But in counter-racist science, no, we don't advocate any type of rioting under any circumstance. No riots. But if you're going to be counter-violent, you have a well-made plan that goes after the people who are causing the problem. Strictly. No one else. And that's outlined in the textbook for victims of white supremacy. Because things don't bother people. You know, a car sitting there parked, it's not bothering anybody. So you're burning the car to do what? To send a message to a person. But why not not just send the message to the person? That's it. Negotiations or whatever. Mm -hmm. Precision. Codification is about precision in every move you make. Okay. Before I take your next question, Anthony, uh, to all my listeners, and particularly to uh, one of the technicians, Moon Pie, and also to Robert, I just got a message from one of my people who look out for myself and Mr. Fuller, uh, Brother Javari, and he did indicate just now, unless you fixed it, the website, the website is down. So, uh, Brother Anthony, uh, you have been confirmed, but now I need uh, Brother Moon Pie and also um, uh, Brother Robert to uh, check into that so we can verify that. Okay, what is your second question, Anthony? Okay, the second qu- question is, is uh, Fuller, you, you, you speak on um, anyone who unjustly kills another person, they... They they should be in a uh, jail cell, uh, confined with only them and a gun. And I wanted I wanted to to uh, know the does this apply to supremacist and and race soldiers as well, who unjustly ca- kill people? Yes, all over the planet that should apply to everyone without exception. Two things should happen when somebody kills somebody. Right off, right off the top, this is code. Worldwide, we should do everything we can to get this law passed, in my opinion. Worldwide. Because when a person is killed, that's serious business. One person, we take killing for granted. Like, hey, this is, this is always, people kill people. I mean, we kill people by the millions. I mean, so what? I mean, you know, what else is new? Whole hump. That's the way the whole world has gotten. I mean, someone gets killed last night in a car wreck or whatever. I mean, oh, well, business as usual. Uh, go on, turn the page to the sports page. Let's get on to something serious. I mean, somebody dying, somebody got shot, somebody cut somebody's throat. That's no big deal. And, you know, well, so what? Who cares? I mean, you know, talk about something else. I mean, you know, we're supposed to be having fun. That's how the whole world has gotten, particularly under this system called the system of white supremacy. Because they glorify violence. They praise violence. If there's not some violence going on, they are very unhappy. That's the way they think. So when one person kills anywhere on the planet, two things should happen immediately. Everybody should know who did it, doesn't make any difference whether it's white or non-white or whomever, male, female, whatever. Somebody got killed. And everyone, at the moment that it happens, should know two things. Everybody on the planet. Who did it and why? Now, that's just for openness. And if they find out that it was deliberate and unjust, in other words, it wasn't a justifiable homicide, Under any circumstance, the person that did the killing should be apprehended, in other words, caught, put into a jail cell in these modern times, if you have the facilities, try to make them as approximate as you possibly can, even under most 
primitive conditions put somewhere. But in a modern society, in a jail cell, since we have many jail cells, but that jail cell is like a tomb. You go into there, and the last person you will ever talk to on this planet will be the guard that puts you in there. When he slams that door, you are in there. You will never talk to another person except a person that you meet in the other world because the only person you'll be talking to from now on is yourself, just like the person who's in that coffin that you kill. They can't talk to anybody, so you don't talk to anybody. It's not going to be any arguments with the guards behind a homicide, I mean behind murder, what we call murder one. That's what the code, which this is outlined in the textbook for victims of white supremacy. It's called maximum emergency compensatory confinement. And this should be a law everywhere. And you're in there with the weapon that you use if they can find it or one similar to it. And for quote unquote humane purposes, if you have a gun available in that society, wherever it happens to be on the planet, you have that gun in a glass case, and you can take it out anytime you get ready. It's got one bullet in it, because even though you may have shot a person four or five times, you just get one chance with yourself, all right, because that person that you kill had one chance with themselves, trying to get away from being shot, all right, being murdered. And so you sit there and look at it, and you talk to that gun, because that's the only friend you got. That's the friend you accomplished in what you did in taking somebody out of this universe willfully and deliberately. We're talking about murder now. We're not talking about self-defense. But this is what you did. You sit there and talk to that gun. If you want to talk to somebody, that's who you're going to be talking to until you finally decide to use it. You'll be fed through a trap door because you will never talk to anybody again because the person that you kill will not talk to anybody again. It's the most reasonable way, the most logical way to look at this thing about murder, about killing, because everybody on this planet should be out of that business altogether. Murder is something that should never happen. Murder is something that when you hear somebody talk about murder, they won't know what you're talking about because they'll say, you mean to tell me somebody killed somebody? This is the way we should be talking in 2020 all over the world, just about now. And we can make it that way uh, as best we possibly can. I don't know if it will fully work or not. But one thing, when somebody kills somebody in the northwestern hemisphere, because you've got so many options, the first thing, a person thinks about when they get caught after having killed somebody is, well, now, what's going to happen to me? Can I say this? Can I say that? Can I go into court? In other words, there's too much wiggle room. We should eliminate that wiggle room, period. And the first thing you do is find out, you know, you'll take your time and make sure that the person who is charged with murder really did it. No more mistakes. Those mistakes have to be ruled out. you got to make absolutely certain. But once it's absolutely certain that the person did it, that person goes into maximum emergency compensatory confinement and stays there until they use their friend, their partner, in this murder to make a contract with him or herself, blow his own brains out. And while he's in there, he better not get a toothache. Because now you got an opportunity hmm. now to really get out of here. I mean, shoot that tooth out. See how that works. So 25 to life is not enough. Oh, not for murder. No, no. We don't. You see, in other words, they have made a game out of this thing. Gamemanship should go out of this whole business of what you call murder one, homicide number one. You do willfully and deliberately. You willfully, not an accident. You willfully and deliberately kill someone and and unjustly. You had no reason to do it that made sense. You did it. See, we have made fun out of murder. You take all the fun out of it. 
by saying, hey, there's no, this is an absolute. There's no exceptions to this. Everybody who does it all over the world, it's not going to be no long, drawn-out court process and all of this playing games with law that we're experiencing and have experienced like forever. No, it's going to be absolute. And nobody should be paid to kill you. You can stay in there and eat and sleep all you want to. But you'll never talk to anybody else except yourself. Because that's who you need a good talking to. Talk to yourself. And your friend, that gun that you use. You can talk to it all you want to because that's the only friend you got. All your other friends you've been cut off from because you don't need any other friends. You're a murderer. You're getting what you put out. That's the law of compensation. You get back what you put out. And you get it back not from somebody else. This thing of paying somebody to kill somebody is crazy. Here in the Northwestern Hemisphere and in other parts of the world, you go and give a guy three and four hundred dollars. I mean, a guy don't even know you or don't even involve you, but he's an executioner. Back in the old days, they used to put a mask over the executioner and have him stand over someone and chop his head off. But you never know who the person behind the mask is. You're encouraging more murder. You're getting somebody. You're paying somebody money to kill somebody. Mafia style. That's all that is. They need to stop that. Stop and think about it, folks. That's crazy in a civilized society. And yet in the Northwestern Hemisphere, they'll say, well, we don't believe in cruel and unusual punishment. Well, in some places, you still have people injecting people with poison, and then you're going to pay somebody to do it? No. If you're going to take a murderer and poison that murderer, and the only reason you should use poison is because the murderer used poison to kill the person that they kill. That's logical. That's humane. Kill yourself. You like killing so much, homeboy or, or the white supremacist or anybody else, you like killing? Oh, you like guns. That's your friend. That's going to be your only friend in the end, and that end is going to come real soon because nobody's going to hide you. There's no such thing as snitching against a murderer. None. That's what you call constructive information. And it should be all over the world and mandatory and should be taught from the first grade of any school. Get that out of the way right quick before you get to ABCs. That this is what should happen. This is what is going to happen. It's going to be an absolute. Now, this is covered in the textbook for victims of white supremacy in the war section, and also some of it in the law section. Hello? Hello? Is anybody there? Hello? Yeah, you're okay, Mr. Fuller. All right. All right. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dollar Bill. Uh, don't be a stranger. Uh, uh uh, Anthony, that is. Let me get this in here. Uh, I've got do dollar bill coming up. Oh, yes, the uh, technicians have just informed me that the uh, site is now back up, so you can um, you can get back on the site now. The problem has been rectified. I had two or three different conversations going on, but uh, thank you for that. We've got dollar bill coming up. Along, uh, ben from Liberia calling from Minnesota. Everett is also in the house, so let's do this here. Uh, by the way, Mr. Fuller, uh, speaking about that murder and murder for hire, a disturbing report has come out, I guess it's from St. Louis, about um, Mrs. Robbie, or Miss Robbie, uh, who has the restaurant called Sweetie Pies in St. Louis. It has been alleged that her son uh, has uh, alleged now murder for hire uh, 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 killed her uh, nephew, and it's been all over the the place. Uh, if that b pans out to be true, everything that you just said, that would also apply to him? It applies to anybody who kills somebody unjustly. He had somebody Unjustly killed. means you willfully and deliberately take someone out of the universe. Okay. 
You're not a, a person is not a creator. You don't create people. You don't have the business taking anybody out of here. Okay. Unjustly. Let me you correct myself. You can do myself. it in self-defense. Now, in self-defense, definitely. Okay. I mean, a- anybody who's trying to uh, murder someone and you stop that person from murdering someone else by killing them, uh, or, or that, that, that's always in line. Oh, yeah, for sure. That, that's a part of the war. But I'm talking about you don't like something that somebody said or the way they looked at you, like a whole lot of this stuff that goes on and has been going on like forever, just among black people themselves. This is no game. Okay. This is not funny. Okay. I mean, this can be ingrained in somebody's head at a, at a young age and passed on to generation to generation. That's why we have all this killing out here. No. No. You, you think that you have the duty or the right or you're just bored and you're going to kill somebody just to see them fall down and jump in the car and drive off and laugh? No. That's not funny. Yeah. All right. Uh, the whole world should chase you down. I mean, with you running as long as you can find something to step on, and you put into that condition, compensatory, solitary confinement, until do you do to yourself what you did to somebody else. Do it to okay. yourself. You owe that to yourself and to the universe. All right. L- let me get this straight. He uh, he has been arrested. That is uh Miss Miss Robbie's son Tim, he has been arrested and allegedly has been charged with a murder for hire of his nephew. I think the sum was four hundred and fifty thousand dollars that he took out of an insurance policy. But all this is alleged that he had this done along with an accomplishment and the names have been listed and so forth and all that. Uh, He hasn't been convicted of it. It's just an alleged situation now, so let me get that uh, straight. Okay, let's do this. Um, Thank you for the uh, people in the chat room. It's banging in there. Okay, we got Dollar Bill coming up here from the 646. Let me see, Dollar Bill, if I can get you in here. There we go. Dollar Bill, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. I just wanted morning, to say sir. very quickly, good morning, Mr. Fuller. Once again, back again, your words on the murder were so impressive this morning and so true. We have made murder fun. That was absolute. And the two, and the gun example was true fire. I just wanted you to know that. Thank you. You're very up on point. What I want to ask you today, Mr. Fuller, um, we have been um, – uh, uh, we're in this election period So if I Or Someone that you knew were a politician If I was a politician Who endeavored to use the code Of the independent compensatory The independent compensatory code What would be some things That I would focus on To eliminate the system Of white supremacy, racism From your book and Mr. Bobby, please don't hang up on me because I'm, I'm listening online because it's still not working on the computer. I'm, I'm listening on my phone. Thank you. But your question is uh, to 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 write a what book. Would, no, I'm, I'm saying if I were a politician who endeavored to use the code uh, uh, that you have put out, what would be some things that I would focus on? during my period, uh, to eliminate the system of racism, white supremacy. And using the code From your book. book. Yes, oh, sir. you can use the entire book. That's what the book is for. The book is addressed to people, people, period. And uh, you, we're all in politics. Politics just means people interaction. It's listed in the book on the sixth area of activity, People relations. You know, that's why we use the word police. Police of politics. Being polite. That's between people. How are you going to be polite if you're not a person? Of course, in the animal kingdom, you might say, quote, unquote, I mean, they might have some policies and whatnot that you can study where they interact with each other in a polite. They're not people, but, you know. But you can 
include that as a description for how they get along with each other and whatnot. But animals fight just like people do, and all of that should be eliminated, really. People are not supposed to act like the animals when it comes to things like fighting. We're supposed to be beyond that. We're supposed to be able to talk to each other, communicate in such a way that it's not going to be any fight. And black people should, more than anybody, should be pioneering that. No, it's not going to be a fight, and it's not going to be an argument that's going to lead to a fight. That's why in the code book, getting back to your point, you can just say you don't have contact with anybody if it looks like it's going to lead to conflict. I mean, you break no conflict, no contact. The only way that you can have conflict with somebody, you break contact. That's why That's why doing this virus, a lot of people who like to make, like what old folks used to call mess, they are going crazy because they are not in contact with the people that they can get in contact with to start some mess. See, some people are just devoted. Devoted, actually. They're not even happy unless they're somewhere making contact with somebody so they can get what? Get some mess started, okay? But if you can't make contact with people, you can't get mess started. So the code says no contact, no conflict. That's that's a part of the code. But a specific answer to your question, yes, that's what the textbook is for. It's to use in everyday situations. Everyday situations for what? to correct what needs correcting. That's what a so-called politician is supposed to be doing, correcting what needs correcting, because everything is either constructive or non-constructive. There's no such thing as in between. So anybody, everybody's a politician, really, if you're interacting with people. So in every situation, every day, on the job and where else, you just stand back and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, everybody's doing all this talking, but there's one question here. What is the most constructive thing to do, and what is the most non-constructive thing to do? And you pick the thing that is most constructive. It's really very simple. In every situation, everything is going to be constructive or non-constructive. All righty. Thank you, uh, Dollar Bill uh, from uh, New York. I'm going to put you on mute so you're on that. I uh, didn't hang up on you. Yeah, you're back on mute, so you can still uh, listen to the show. Okay, we've come to the conclusion of the first hour of the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. Thank you for listening. We do apologize for all of our technical difficulties. I was just informed that if you refresh your browser for ProduceJustice.com, it'll come back up. The technicians have indicated that it is up and running, so refresh your browser. Again, you've been listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby. Stay tuned for the second hour of the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Okay, welcome back to the Counter Racist Code Show. Here on ProduceJustice.com, a lot of people like to go to well, Ed Blog Talk. ProduceJustice.com with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby. We've been working through some issues here, and what I understand, they are all resolved. So you can all all listen and and go to ProduceJustice.com for any other information. All the books are in, and everything is going on. It's all up. Uh, the technicians have indicated that Brother Javari, he needs to get in contact with me. He also watches out for me. But if you have any questions, you know what to do. Call call this number, which is 516-453-9921. And be sure to hit the number one button. Press it, and then you'll go to the top of the line. Or you can Gmail me at the numero 7, Mr. Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y, at gmail.com, and I will effort to read your letter, but um, it probably will not be read on today's program, but it will be read, and I will inform you. Okay, let's do this. Um, Mr. Fuller, um, somebody wrote in um, about producer. Mr. Fuller, can you tell me exactly what you mean when you use a statement 
stand by your work. Any work that a person does, stand by your work. If you uh, invent a car, you stand by the car. I mean, and somebody will say, well, this car is, this is a, this thing is a car? Uh, I bought one of these things. I mean, it fell apart on me. Well, if you're the person that invented that car, it fell apart. Stand up and say, yeah, well, I invented a product that didn't work very well. It was supposed to work. I intended for it to work, but it didn't work out. So you stand up. Don't let somebody take the blame for something that you did or take credit. This, because this does what? It causes all kind of confusion. And uh, compensatory science, first of all, any kind of science is supposed to be about eliminating fusion. That is what is really scientific. You never have confusion. And the white supremacists are the masters of manufacturing confusion. They know how to deconfuse things, but they also know how to manufacture confusion. They know both. But they choose among the non-white people of the planet to go everywhere, and their basic weapon cause confusion in every area of activity when you're among dark people. If you're a white person, that is your duty. First order of business, and the second order of business, and the third, and the fourth. Cause confusion among them, and then, because scientifically it's been proven, the person who can cause the most confusion among any people will be the dominant person. Because the person who is fused will always dominate people who are the most confused. So the white supremacists found out a long time ago. That's why they are in that supreme uh, position. That if you can confuse non-white people in economics, in education, in entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, you can always dominate them. So some people, as an old cliche, I don't know if somebody really said this, said they speak with forked tongue. Say one thing, do another. Now, if you're saying one thing and doing another, you're causing what? Confusion. And the person who is always confused is always going to be subject to the person who is not confused. It's all kinds of illustrations you see about this. So stand by your work. So if everybody stands by the work that they do, if I tell a lie, I have to stand by my, you know, stand by my lie. I say, well, I lied. I mean, you know, hey, <laughs> I thought I was telling a good lie, and it really went over big, but it didn't work too well. But I'm the one I'm the one that told the lie. It wasn't George down the street there. It wasn't somebody else. It wasn't Mary over here and Alice over there. No, I'm the one that did it. So whatever you do, stand by your work. That's what that means. That's, that's in the code book itself. Stand by your work. If you write something, Stand by the work that you wrote. If you say something, stand by that work. If you did something, stand by that work. And don't take credit for something or blame for something that somebody else did. And that eliminates what? Confusion. Because confusion is what causes all kinds of problems. When people have to leave a conversation scratching their heads. That's never supposed to happen. No one on the planet should ever leave a conversation scratching your head. I mean, mm -hmm. that means that you, you're confused about what the conversation was about. No, you're not supposed to be confused. You might be upset or you might be dissatisfied or something, but you're not supposed to be confused. Okay. Uh, just a note here. Um, I was given this message from some of my people. It says, um, uh, tell your listeners to go to Blog Talk Radio to produce justice. 
and I guess you can listen to this show there because we've had a slight issue there, but my technicians here have worked it out, and all you have to do if you were having that problem is to refresh your browser. That's what I was told to tell you, to refresh your browser, and then it should work perfectly. Okay. Sorry about those. We apologize for those issues, but that's that's what happens. Okay. Uh, let's go here. Uh, let's see. Ben from Liberia, from Liberia calling from Minnesota. Let me see if I can get you on here, brother. Okay. There you are. All right, Ben, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Bobby. So, Mr. Porter, one of the things that I've learned uh, listening to and reading the compensatory uh, course system here is I've been always into trying to educate, 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 even when I'm with friends. And I've used social media platforms to educate people by talking about the white supremacy. And I know this is very, very dangerous because I understand that I'm a victim of this system and I'm a prisoner of war. And as a prisoner of war, I know what can happen when you talk prison system or what's going on. You know, I can expect to be dead anytime. And that comes with the territory. And it's something that I have come to accept. Uh, now, I'm not suicidal. I'm not, uh, 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 it's not something that I don't put myself in the firing line. No, 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 no. I try to stay as much as possible and preserve my life. We always talk about that. But, Mr. Fuller, how important it is to speak the truth about the system of white supremacy and understanding the consequence of speaking the truth. But you still speak the truth anyway. How important is that? It's very important, but you also do it in such a way that you get what you are trying to do. You don't do ever do anything that you don't think will, won't work. Now, you might take some chances sometimes, but you try to reduce that as much as you possibly can. And uh, in a world that's dominated by non-justice, you stay focused on what I'm trying to, on what you're trying to do is produce a product called justice. And you stay in the question lane as much as you possibly can. If somebody objects to what you're saying, your first question is, Sir, ma'am, why are you objecting to what I am saying? And then you listen to their answer. They'll say, well, for, you know, for example, I object to what you're saying because what you're saying isn't true. Then you stay in the question lane. Well, ma'am, sir, what is it that I said that wasn't true? Because you always want to make sure that if you're saying something about something that you think is true and you said it to speak the truth and someone says they object to what you're saying because it's not true, then you want to know what the truth is. That's the compensatory way. You're seeking truth. That's the first thing you definitely have to have. So if you're making an error, you want somebody to correct you. So you ask that person, stay in that question lane, what is it that I've said that isn't true, and what is it that I should be saying that would be true? And then you examine the answers that you get. And then stay in the question lane if you have any questions about the answers that you get. That's the compensatory procedure. When there's, it looks like everything is heading toward an argument, a black person should never be involved in an argument. You should be involved in conversations. Now, what's the difference between an argument and a conversation? An argument is designed to win arguments. A conversation is designed to get to the truth. And how do you get to the truth about any matter? Questions and answers. You can't go to the moon and back without getting to the truth through questions and answers. The first thing you do, the first people that looked at the moon, probably said, what is that? That's a question. What in the world is that? That thing that's sitting up there, 
I mean, there's something holding it up and whatnot, and it seems to be moving around in different places. I see it over here sometimes, and I see it over there at another time. What in the world is that thing? And it's so close. Sometimes it looks so close that you can reach out and touch it. I wonder if we can. See, these are all questions. Why? Because all through the history of the world, this is an absolute. All problems are solved through the process of what? Questions and answers. So stay in the question lane. So in that, that way you avoid arguments. Because when you ask people a question, the burden is on them now. Have you ever noticed that in a conversation? <clears throat> you are asking the questions here on this program. People are asking me questions. It means what? Automatically. I have to do most of the thinking. When a person asks you a question, you've got to do the thinking now. The person who asks the question doesn't have to do no thinking. <laughs> the, the burden is always on the person who's trying to answer the question. That's why in a court, lawyers will sometimes jump up and say, don't answer that. <laughs> yes. And the judge will have to calm the lawyer down. Why? Because the lawyer knows that if that person keeps answering those questions, that person who's on the hot seat, <laughs> they're going to lose this case. <laughs> and the mm-hmm. defense lawyer knows that. Hmm. The, okay. person who has, the person who a- asks the questions has the most power. Mm-hmm. And almost without, without exception, the person who asks the question is the person who has to answer the questions who is in the weak position. That person has to do the thinking. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Ben from uh, Minnesota. Uh, don't be a don't be a stranger, uh, Mr. Fuller. Uh, I noticed over the years that you and I have been doing this that the seems that there's a tremendous amount of questions in the areas of religion, sex, and war. It just today has been on war, or and and murder in particular, um, um, and you've made some statements regarding that, particularly uh, you know what you said in the first hour. Uh, if you didn't hear that, uh, people, uh, you need to go back and get the first hour. Uh, recently, here in this concept called the United States. Uh, there has been shootings just about every day, even in the locale that I am at. You know, it's just it's just horrible. Um, in uh, I believe it was Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, they showed some suspected uh, race soldiers who were in back of a black man walking with a knife. And I understand that they did tase this young man and trying to get the man to halt as he was going into a convenience store with a knife in his hand and uh, failing to follow the instructions. Um, They stopped the video after they had fired so you couldn't see him uh, fall down, uh, and he was pronounced uh, dead. Um, In Kenosha, Wisconsin, another uh, black man in a similar situation, uh, was shot down, and I'm saying by suspected uh, race soldiers. They shot him in his back. Uh, The latest information I got just a few moments ago is that he was not dead, but he is paralyzed. Um, Now, um, I don't know if there's going to be a trial. I don't know the circumstances, but if if there is, and I don't really know the question I'm trying to ask, but but it looked like it was a public execution. To me, it did. And I'm not saying that because I'm black. But these people were walking away. Now, I know we're not supposed to fuss, fight, or flee. I understand that. They were walking away. Their backs were turned. There was no threatening motion by either one of the black men. And yet and still, they were gunned down. Uh couldn't they? Couldn't the peace officers or, or race soldiers shoot them in the leg rather than shoot to kill? Or what is the situation?
situation concerned this? Should they be brought up and put in uh, uh, that maximum emergency compensation thing? Because they they did it. It looked like to me that they executed him. I'm not saying that they did. I'm just saying it looked like it did. Yes, but you should expect this. Black people should expect this. We should expect this at all times because we should not look at ourselves like we are what they call, and that word is kicked around very loosely, free. Black people of this planet in the system of white supremacy are prisoners of war. And the entire planet is a prison camp. We got to get that get that in our heads. We are born in a prison called the system of white supremacy. That's the name of the prison. If you are a person of color and you're on the planet called Earth, you are born in a place that is a prison, and the name of that place which is a prison, is the system of white supremacy. It's designed to dominate and mistreat people in their skin by people who are classified as white in the system of white supremacy. That's what it is, clear and simple. So as a prisoner of war, you can expect to be shot for a reason or for no reason at all. We have to get that in our heads. You can expect to be dead at any time, inside or outside of anything, in a car, in your house, which really isn't your house. It's just a cell in the system of white supremacy that you are allowed to occupy. And if the prison masters want to come into that cell and kill everybody in that cell, which you call your house, so be it. That's the way you have to look at it, because that's the situation that you're in. And if you're at a gas station getting gas, or whatever, or someone calls and says it's a a suspicious person going through the neighborhood, and people show up with guns in a prison camp, which is where you are, black person, black males like myself. I'm in a prison camp. Fully, you look up and see yourself surrounded by people with guns. Don't fuss. Don't fight. Don't flee. If I'm told, freeze. I freeze. If I'm told to get in that car, get in the car. If I'm told to put my hands on top of my head, that's exactly what I'm going to do instantly. And I'm going to try to do it slowly or at a pace so that they don't think that I'm trying to do something else. Because if they shoot me, I'm just dead. That's the way I look at it. That's the way the code says I should look at it. Because those are the circumstances that I am in. Whining about it, flowers, balloons, raggedy, uh, Uh, teddy bears soaking in the rain on the spot where I died, that's a bunch of foolishness, and we should stop it. Hugs and hoping that it doesn't happen again sometime soon, forget that. It's going to happen. It can happen. Don't walk away. Don't look like you're doing anything except breathing, and you're going to stop breathing if you're not doing anything at all. In a prison camp, a prison guard has a whole lot of leeway as a prisoner of war. If anybody's seen movies about prisoners of war, you don't have any options if you're a prisoner. You can just be walking along, I mean, taking your regular break that they allow you to have, and somebody decides to shoot you in the back of the head while you're taking your break for no reason at all. But there is a reason. You're a prisoner of war. You're nothing. That's where a black male in particular is on 
this planet called Earth. I don't care if you're in Johannesburg or you're in Baltimore or you're in Fresno, California. You're a black male. You're born in prison, a prison system called the prison of white supremacy. That's real. And if you think that you're kind of exempt from sudden death, you've got another thing coming. We ought to learn that by now. There's a license to kill you. By whom? Just about anybody that wants to, particularly anybody white, and especially anybody white who's wearing a uniform and a badge and a gun. You are eligible for sudden death at any time, anywhere. Breathing while black, existing while black, driving while black, walking while black, Jogging while black. Whatever. You're black. Target practice time. That's it. No other options. I have it in my head. Every black person on this planet, particularly black males, should have it in theirs. If you don't have that in your head, you're making a colossal mistake. Okay. All righty, let's do this. Uh, we are now going to the 832 area, and that would be Everett from Houston. Everett, we got you. Finally got you on. Go ahead. Hello? Good morning, Mr. Bob. Good morning, yes, sir. Mr. There's something going morning, on in the background. Can you cut that down a little bit? Because we can't hardly hear you. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. Okay, go go ahead. Hey, sorry about that. Could you could you skip me and come back? Sorry about okay. that. Okay, okay, I'm gonna put you on mute. Okay, all right, uh, put him on mute. Let's go to Ishmael in the 405. Let's see if we can get you on. There we go, Ishmael. Okay. Yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Bobby. Hello, Mr. Fuller. Good morning, sir. Um, good morning. I have a. Uh, a question following the logic that Mr. Fuller has been putting out that I've been listening to for the past couple of weeks. Um, and it's a real basic question, and I want to get to get right to the question. If I have to follow with the logic that I've used, I'll follow it with it. If it's so a quick follow-up, okay. Uh, my question is, uh, the white supremacists, are they anti-creator? And if they're anti, if they are the anti-creator or anti-creator of his creation, uh, do they fall in line with the concept construct that we call devil or evil or the devil? That's my question. And I, and like I said, if you need me to uh, use the logic that I use that you put out, and I, and I just follow some of the things you said to get to this uh, equation, you might want to say. Well, in answer to the question about evil, people do evil deeds. So now it just comes down to what person you're talking to and what the deed was. And as far as uh, the general philosophy of the white supremacists, according to many of them who have said, the few who will admit that they believe in white supremacy, have said in the past that one of them at least has said, he explained it within a religious view. God made white people to serve God. And they made, God made black people to serve white people. And if everybody will just shut up and leave it alone and let it work itself out like that, Everybody will be happy, and everybody will be fine. I'm going to say it again. This came out in the night, you know, because I was bewildered about what is the basic philosophy of the white supremacists. I mean, the basic philosophy for everything that they're doing when it comes to interacting with people of color. And the religious viewpoint has so far, until somebody tells me different, who says that he or she, because that's who you have to get it from, is a white supremacist, say, what's, what's your religious view? 
I mean, how how do you interact with the creator of the entire universe and all the other universes that there's any out there? I mean, uh, so what's your position? What's your position when it comes to interacting with people? That's the answer that so far, within the religious context, that I have gotten from the white supremacists. And that was, and you know, about 40, 50, you know, about 60 years ago, something like that, uh, when I first heard that, that white people were made by the creator of the entire universe. The, the creator, meaning whatever made trees, whatever made flowers, whatever made food. And they made white people, the creator. And made white people to serve the creator and made black people to serve white people. And that's it. And black people ought to stop talking about what they're entitled to and all the rest of this stuff and just shut up and do what white people say. And if they do what white people say, they'll be serving God because white people serve God. But that's the hierarchy. That's the deal. That's the way they present it. And that's the answer that I've gotten from them as far as what has come to me. Now, there are other white people who might, you know, that was just some white people. I don't know if every white person said that, but some white people have said it who said that they also believed in white supremacy. So it's just what the white supremacist says. Your Beck's explanation for anything that people do is to talk to the person who is doing it. Okay. But that's the answer I've received. All righty. Ishmael, thank you for your um, uh, for your question, and um, do not be a stranger. Okay, tell you what we're going to do. Why don't we go ahead and cue this music here so we can run straight through there. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, you're listening to the Counter-Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby. We do apologize for any technical difficulties that we had previously, but my technicians have uh, worked it out. But just in case, if you still are having problems, just I was told to tell you to refresh your browser you know, for ProduceJustice.com, and everything should come up just fine. Thank you, Brother Javari, for also looking out uh, for us there. Okay, you have any questions for the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr., just simply call 516 453 9921 and then press the number one button. There are four callers uh, ahead of you right now, so chances are if you use that, you may not get on. You can also do this you can Gmail me a. At the numero seven, Mr. Bobby B O B B Y, at gmail dot com. At some point in time, not on this show, I don't think that that it will happen. But I will read your Gmail and also inform you of the date and time that your Gmail will uh, would be read. Okay. All righty. With that in mind, uh, let's see here. Let's go to who's on my list here. Darnell, I'm going to try to get you in here. Let's see here. Yeah, okay. Darnell, we are efforting. Let's see. Come on. There we go. There we go. Okay, Darnell, you and Phoenix, 115 big ones out there. You're on with, with Mr. Nelly Fuller, Jr. What is your question? Uh, good morning, Mr. Bobby. Good morning, morning. Mr. Fuller. Good morning, uh, sir. My question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh uh, in the past, Mr. Fuller, you stated that you had uh, was in the presence of a speech of Elijah Muhammad a time or two before. So uh, my question is, um, is there any similarities to what Elijah Muhammad was teaching his students to what the suggestions you have written in the code book? And if so, what is one of those similarities? Oh, I don't know, uh, because that's broadly speaking, and it would be very difficult for me to specify any uh, particular thing. Reason being, everybody I have ever heard, because I've been asked this question before, 
everybody I've been exposed to, everything that I've ever experienced has influenced me because people ask me uh, every now and then, like you're doing now, uh, where is my greatest influence? And it's difficult for me to say because everything is connected. All nine areas of it are connected. Everything in the universe, that's why it's called the universe. This is universal law. It just doesn't apply to Fuller. And I discovered that, that everybody influences everybody that they come in contact with. Either for, if it's, sometimes it's just for five minutes, and then you forget that you ever had contact with the person. But during that five minutes, you were influenced by that person simply because the person is there. You walk around a person, like right now during the virus, COVID-19. You are influenced by a person that you're in the grocery store with because you suddenly realize you are standing closer to them than the six feet that are prescribed. So you get away and stand back in that little square that they have marked off in the grocery store so that you'll be six feet away from the other person because the other person doesn't have a mask on, maybe. And you suddenly notice that. That is influence. Now, it's the same way. And this is the way I think that everybody, when they ask about who influenced them, well, my goodness, my first grade teacher certainly had an influence on me. Because Miss Morrison, I'll call her name because I owe a lot to her. She flunked me first grade. She said, Fuller is having trouble spelling. So she told my second grade teacher, I'm going to hold him back. I don't know how long I'm going to hold him back, but we're going to pass on the rest of the class. But Fuller is having trouble with that spelling pad. But I think I can spot what the trouble is, and I'll send him to you when I think he's ready. And Miss Jones agreed. That was the latest name in the second grade. And so my first grade teacher, Miss Morrison, I almost tear up when I think about it, her influence. I was bewildered. I was confused. I didn't want to be held back. But she knew that in order to propel me forward, I wasn't going nowhere if I didn't know how to spell. So when she worked with me, for a short period of time, I think it was about two weeks, first grade teacher, and passed me on to Miss Jones, I was burning those spelling pads up. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't get enough spelling pads. Give me more. <laughs> Give me more. <laughs> I was I was spelling everything. Uh, so getting back to your central question, influence by Elijah Muhammad, by Marcus Garvey, by everybody I've ever been exposed to. But in answer to the question, more than anything, of who influenced me more than anybody else, if you want to quantify it, it's always the same answer. The white supremacists of this planet, racist man and racist woman, have had more influence on everything that I do, everything that I think, everything that I think I want to do, I guess, the concept of justice was given to me by them. Why? They are my masters, that's why. I haven't had any other masters here on the planet. Racist man and racist woman, my greatest influence, and against racism. They taught me that, too, by being racist and showing me how evil it is. That's influence. Yes. Okay. Darnell... From Phoenix, thank you for your call, and do not be a stranger. Okay, let's go down here to the 704 area code. That would be you, Sylvia. You are now on with Mr. Fuller. You can be heard. What is your question? Hello, Sylvia? Yes. Okay, you can be heard. What is your question for Mr. Fuller? Um, I didn't call me. Beg, beg your pardon? 
I didn't call in. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. You just had that question mark there. Okay, I'll I'll move on. Thank you for listening. I'm gonna put you back on mute then. Uh, okay, let me thank see. You. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, Sylvia's on mute. Okay, let's go back up to. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, Everett. Yeah, there you go, Everett. Let's see if you're on now. Uh, let's see if you're ready. Okay, Everett, are you ready now? Morning, Mr. Bobby. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. Good My morning. apologies. That's okay. Go ahead, brother. Yes, um, my question is, um, uh, for the, this for the last couple of weeks, um, I've been watching the politics a lot. Last week was the Democratic Democrat nomination week. This week is the Republican nomination week. Mr. Fuller. Is this a form of white supremacy versus white supremacy? Or should we be like, well, as long as I follow code, I'm going to try to stop white supremacy, even though these two parties are fighting with each other? Yeah, so uh, to the extent, this is the way I put it in the code book, uh, so that I don't get the impression that I'm talking about all white people. Because I don't know all white people. I mean, everything in code is supposed to be talking about the truth. But I'm talking about the white people who believe in white supremacy. They always contest each other about the best way to go about practicing white supremacy. Just they are they operate the same way that you see in the movies. That's why the Godfather. One and two is on the list of movies right there, very prominent, that I talk about quite a bit. Uh, They fight among themselves. About what? Fight among themselves about what? About turf. Like there's a scene in Godfather 1 where the person stands up and says, look, we're killing each other, and, you know, we'll have to do that every now and then. That's a part of the business because we have fallen out. But we come together, and, you know, when everything calms down so everybody can make money because nobody's making any money while we're killing each other. So we're all about making money. So we're here having this conference, and the Corleones are here, the Tatayas, the Barzinis, they're all here. So we're going to settle these disputes today. And we have these disputes, just like you just said. That's the way the white supremacists operate. They have wars called civil wars and all this. I mean, bloody wars where they slaughter each other. But at some point, they come together, have a truce to start off with, and then they declare the peace, just like they did in Godfather One. Mr. Barzini, one of the mobsters, said, "Hey, we're we're sucking for the peace. We got you know we we got a truce, but truce don't last. So we got to figure a peace settlement. We got to make a contract." You know, where everybody gets a piece of the action and everything is just fine. And so the action is going to be what? We're going to sell drugs. And this is in the 1972 movies. Say, we're going to go into the drug business and we're going to be selling it to the dark people, the colleges. They are animals anyway. Let them lose their souls. See, we're not going to have it nowhere near our schools or anything like that where we affect our own people. All right, but that didn't work out in reality. But what they put in that movie came true. See, and that's an excellent example of what you're talking about. The white supremacists, they fight each other all the time about whether we're going to have the slaves doing this type of work or we're going to have them doing factory work somewhere else, or we're going to have them on the plantation. And, you know, just like brothers having a falling out who are in business together, the white supremacists operate the same way. There are two white men, I'll give that as an example, running a grocery store. Sam is the black person. He works back in the back in the warehouse area. They are up front. Now, Sam hears a commotion going on up front. 
So he goes up to see what's going on. Sam is black. He just works there. And the two brothers are fighting. And they're fighting about what? About how much they're going to pay Sam. Or about how the grocery store is being run. One brother disagrees with the other. And one brother may get Sam to help him throw his own brother, the white guy, out in the street. One white man getting a black person to help him throw the other person who is white but his brother into the street get out of here you're no longer a partner with me you're my brother but i mean you know hey you're afraid of and godfather gotta get rid of you just go on somewhere get out of my store i got the biggest interest in it anyway i started the store and you came over and started working here you're my brother then we hired sam all right but i'm gonna get sam to help me throw you out of here so now you're out in the street But here's what, the way it always works in the system of white supremacy. Sam goes back there working for the same wage he always got back there in the back. Mm -hmm. And over a period of a year or two, the brothers make up. And the brother, he calls them back in. And they're still partners. And they're making all the money. And Sam haven't improved his condition at all, even though he helped to throw one of the brothers out in the street two years ago. If you look at it like that, you're looking at the world the way it really is in the system of white supremacy. Okay. All righty, let's do this here quickly. Uh, I'll tell you what, let me do this. Mr. Fuller, before we take the last few calls, I need for you to speak about your book so we can go ahead on with the rest of the show. Yes, sir. All the things that I'm talking about, except for the illustrations that I make up off the top of my head, (laughs) are outlined in the textbook for victims of white supremacy. You go to ProduceJustice.com. And now, it's three volumes there, but they're all basically the same book. One is a continuation. The 2016 is an updated book version of the 1984 edition. But some people want the 1984 edition, even though the 2016 edition is an updated version, revised, expanded edition of the 1984 edition. Then there's another volume there called a word guide, how to use words, how not to use words, what words to ask questions about when other people use them and wait for their answers. Don't try to help them with the answer. And that's a whole volume for that. Basically, they're all the same book. They're just in different volumes. But the two volumes that are basically on the forefront now is the 19, uh, 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 correction, 2016 edition and the 2010 edition of the Word Guide. The 1984 edition has been updated in the 2016 edition. I want that understood. But if you get the 2016 edition and the word guide, you have the composite, really, of one book into two volumes. That's really what it is. The word guide is an addition to the 2016 edition. In addition to the 2016 edition, go to ProduceJustice.com. ProduceJustice.com, and that's where you get the volumes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Uh, Let's see here. Let's go to the 586 area code, and that would be Leona. Leona, good morning, and you're on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question? Uh, Good morning. Uh, Mr. Fuller, your illustration today about prisoners of war – hit me at another level, a deeper level today. And my question to you is um, this term, prisoners of war. Um, I used to think I knew what that meant. I, I, you know, in my mind it was associated with Vietnam, POW, prisoner of war. Uh, but your illustration today defined it on another 
another level to me. Now, given that the racist man and racist woman use deception and violence to maintain and establish and expand the system of racism, white supremacy, it, um, do they, why, um, is it beneficial for them to deceive non-white people, black people, into thinking they are not prisoners of war? What, what, what's, um, what I mean is, um, how do you keep it for, foremost in your mind that as a person in the system of racism, white supremacy, you are, in fact, a prisoner of war, and the war is a system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, I don't. Maybe I'm not being precise enough, but what what is it that these white supremacists do to make black people think they're not prisoners of war? How, how are we getting that trick bag? By telling them that they're free, just like they told the slaves, you're free. And Floyd McKissick of Congress of Racial Equality back in the 1960s said the slaves weren't freed. They were fired. And so I came along later, and I looked at that, and I thought that was that was uh, just about wrapped it up. That's true. Slaves weren't freed. They were fired. And then I stopped and thought about that. I said, when you look at it a different way, and that's the way I choose to look at it now, the slaves were neither freed nor fired. They were transferred. Because what is a slave? See, it comes down to definitions. That's why definitions of words are very important in answer to your question. Definitions. What is a slave exactly? A slave is a person who is being mistreated, a person who is being mistreated, and that person doesn't know how to stop the mistreatment. That's a slave. If you own a job and you are being mistreated, and you don't know how to stop the mistreatment, you're a slave. That's anywhere in the world. Everybody can be enslaved by anybody. All you have to do is just look at it that way. It depends on how you choose to look at it, and that's the logical way of of looking at slavery. Slavery has never ended. Because why? Somebody's being mistreated. Every minute, all over the planet, and they don't know what to do about it. They can't handle the mistreatment. They try to think about doing this and think about doing that and try to come mm-hmm. up with a plan for that. But while you are being mistreated, even if it's for 15 minutes, you are a slave to the person who is mistreating you for 15 minutes. That's the definition of a slave. You're being mistreated for 15 minutes. Didn't go any further than that. But during that period, you didn't know what to do about the mistreatment. And you had to put up with the mistreatment for 15 minutes. You were a slave for 15 minutes. Now, in the system of white supremacy, black people are born into slavery in the year 2020. You're born into slavery. It's a slave system. And... Anytime you are a slave to someone else, you're being mistreated and don't know what to do about it, you're also a prisoner of war. Because slavery is war. It's no difference. See, we've got to get the words straight about what's really going on. Because the white supremacists are masters of words. And they'll say, oh, you're free. But like Floyd <laughs> McKissick said, no, you're fired. And like I'm saying, you weren't freed or fired. You were transferred because the mistreatment never stopped. Mm-hmm. See, just because you're not on a plantation doesn't say that you're not a slave. You've just mm-hmm. been transferred to somewhere else, but you're treated the same in okay. economics, education, whatever. All righty. Leona, thank you so much, dear, for uh, for your question, and uh, don't be a stranger. Thank you so much. Okay, Mr. Fuller, let's do this here. This comes from Monday, Craig, and then we will get to you 
from my, my brother from Dallas. He says this, uh, Mr. Fuller, I've been listening to the show for quite a while, and I appreciate all the information you provide. I have a question about entrepreneurship. I haven't heard you mention entrepreneurship as a way for black people to gain economic financial freedom. I have heard you talk about working a job, and I would love to hear what you think about entrepreneurship and how it could potentially help black people by owning their uh, own businesses. I have heard you mention that your father owned several businesses while he was growing up, while you were growing up. So my question is, how do you, Mr. Fuller, think business ownership could help improve black people's condition in the system of white supremacy? Just like an illustration I gave you on this program uh, earlier. I'll just do it right off the top of my head. I gave the illustration of Sam working in the warehouse of two white brothers who were fighting each other about how the business should be run, including how much Sam should be paid or shouldn't be paid. So Sam, I'm going to continue that within the realm of this question you're asking. Sam gets disgusted with the whole thing of working in the warehouse because he's not getting ahead. He's just paid minimum wage. He's barely able to get by. Can't pay his rent in that one room that he's in and all like that. So Sam says, I'm going into business. I'm going to, I know a little bit about barbecue, so I'm going to open a barbecue stand over on the colored side of town. All right. And, you know, lots of people did that. My father did that. He opened a whole bunch of businesses. Six of them, simultaneously. Hotel and cafe that never closed, all right? Even on so-called holidays, he would be open. Okay. You do that if you can. But remember, there's no such thing as a black person owning anything here in 2020 in the system of white supremacy. That's what white supremacy means, that no black person can own quote, unquote, anything in the system of white supremacy because the system of white supremacy owns black people. So if somebody owns Neely Fuller, anything that Neely Fuller has is owned by whomever owns Neely Fuller. So that word own, you think you got a piece of paper in your hand that says, and you're black? And you own land or you own a business? No, you don't. Because why? In the system of white supremacy, you are owned by the white supremacists. That's what slavery is. That's what being a prisoner of war is. Prisoners of war don't own anything. But as far as going into business, if you can, go into business if you can. But also understand you're going to have limitations, just like my father did. Neely Fuller Sr., and I inherited the businesses, but the businesses went under. Why? The white supremacists made that decision the businesses were going to go under. First of all, white people could not go into any of my businesses, all right? In the small town, it was falling apart, okay? That's number one. So the whole town was dying. So... That old cliche saying, when white people get a cold, black people get pneumonia. So the whole town was dying for white people. That automatically meant it was dying for me, all right? Because I was at a greater disadvantage because I couldn't have white customers. And my customers didn't have any money. White people still had money. So they could go to the white businesses and the white people were prohibited from coming where I was. Now, that's not true anymore in almost any part of the world. If a black person is running a business, he can get white customers too. But you are still limited. Why? Because the white supremacists will come around. They will rezone where your businesses are. Or they will go up on the taxes, just like they do with black people. 
Yes. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're trying to own a house, if you're a black person just working a job, you're trying to own a house. The white supremacist should sit back and wait for you to pay for that house over a period of years, try to pass it on to the next generation, which is something they are eliminating now and have been doing so for some time. They are eliminating the second-generation house. You're an entrepreneur if you're buying a house. That's a business, buying a house for you to live in. But you try to pass it on to your daughter or your cousin or your somebody in your family. Now the white supremacist comes up on the taxes or something like that, or they will put a crack house across the street. That's an old trick that they pull. And you'll get tired of bullets coming through your window, and nobody wants to buy your house, so you sell it cheap. Then the white supremacists <laughs> move in. They do away with the crack house because that ain't nothing to do no way. They allowed that crack house to thrive. In fact, they put it there. All right? Mm-hmm. See, they keep doing this. So you never own anything. Now, you got to right. get that in your mind. If you're right. black and on this planet called Earth, you never own anything. I don't care where you are. In Ghana, okay. Guinea, you don't own anything. The white supremacists tell you what to do. They tell All the right. person who is supposed to be the leader. They tell him what to do. He had better, or he'll come up missing. He'll come up missing. Let me get this last question. Is Brother uh, Sajid from Dallas, uh, you're going to be the last question of the day if I can get you up here. Okay, you're in. Go ahead quickly because I'm short of time. Okay, this is a question from the uh, Revised Expanded Edition. And on page 73 at the bottom, it says, according to compensatory logic, there are only three major ways of gaining so-called capital. And the third one is asking, requesting, and or begging from someone who has capital. Could you explain that uh, in detail, Mr. Fuller, please? Yes. Uh, from what I've been told for years, I couldn't understand what people meant about the differences differences between capitalism, communism, and socialism. And I think most people don't really know. Where are the dividing lines? And I came to the conclusion, based on logic, the system of white supremacy is all of them. It's capitalism, it's communism, and it's socialism. They socialize with each other, starting with the last one. Yes. And, yeah. And then the middle one, they communize with each other, meaning they have things in common, meaning the system of white supremacy. And then getting to the first one, capital, they capitalize off of the entire system. <laughs> so what yes. is capital? Capital, how do you get capital? See, they want everybody to be a capitalist in this area of the world. That's what I keep hearing. Okay. So I'm all for it if it's beneficial and constructive, but how do you get capital? There's only three ways to get it. Now, I don't think anybody teaches this, but this is what I've seen. You invent something that people want or need. Inventors. Somebody invented a computer. That's a lot of capital because somebody wants a computer. But this is a smaller group. The second group, robbing and stealing. And the third group? And the third group is begging. Okay. Now, black people being prisoners of war, the only way we can get capital is to beg. Okay, last question. You say, question well, I ain't going to beg nobody. Uh, yeah, you think you're going into business without begging? Uh, okay, last question before we get off the air. Uh, question uh, from Be Good One. Uh, if Neely Fuller went to a sporting event, would he stand for the national anthem? Oh, yes, because the code covers that. And okay. when you do, you not only say a pledge, if they have a flag there, as they say a pledge too, and they want you to pledge to the flag, you have a pledge, a compensatory uh, pledge for that. And we'll get is, that. Go we'll ahead. Get that go ahead. Go ahead quickly. I do at all times relate to the flag the exact same way the flag relates to me. All righty. Sorry, that we're out go, of time. That will go anywhere at yeah. any time. We're out of time. We'll maybe pick that back up next week. Thank you for listening. Thank you, caller. Sorry for the rush. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We'll try to be better next time here on the Counter-Racist Coach Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Good morning, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fuller.
Thank you for inviting me.